thank you all for coming. Um, and um, I will be walking through a couple of slides that I put together. I didn't put together too many. I, I thought this would be a conversation starter. I often like my presentations to be more conversations anyway. Um, the one thing that I forgot to put in my bio is I just finished my first year of U of T, so I'm very new to all of this. And um, this is this is interesting. New to U of T, but not new to academia. I was at a different institution before before I came here. Um, and some of what I'm going to talk about is related to my experiences there and transitioning to U of T um, going there. Uh, so a little bit. Professor, you're muted right now. Great. I think I hit a button that muted me. But you heard everything I said before, though, right? Yeah, it was just one sentence. That was OK, great. Yeah. yeah. So going going to perspective here, um, the thing that I care about the most um, with students that I encounter is what they do after they have encountered me in the course. Um, that I'm I'm running or the the environment that I'm I'm working on and. Great, I did it again. Um, this wasn't always the case, right? So this, this is the second time I wrote the teaching philosophy statement. When I wrote it the first time, I used to say what I've taught them. Um, over time, I've come to realize that I don't really teach students anything. What I what I what I see my role as is sort of creating learning environments and facilitating the learning and um, helping the students sort of do the learning. Uh, I guess we can call that teaching, but it, it, I, I prefer that they are the active participants in, in what's going on. And I'm just sort of hanging out in the background, um, trying to help out as best as I can. Um, so, so a lot of what I'm going to say next comes from this perspective of creating learning, particular kinds of learning environments that I hope enable um, opportunities to learn in different ways um, for students. All right. So um, pandemic hit and everyone had to go online and then we were griping about it a lot and a lot of us want to return back to normal and in person and and it, it got me thinking about two things. Um, why do we loathe online so much? <laughs> right? Uh, why, why is it a mode or medium that we're not excited about, especially in an educational environment? Um, and then it got me thinking, right? But isn't online a fact of life these days for most of us? Um, and then looking back at this year and looking back pre-pandemic, um, I realized that I've had a lot of virtual experiences and I actually operate, I and others operate virtually, um, even in non-pandemic settings um, for particular reasons and it has great value. So. I'm going to do a little bit of reflection on my experiences in a virtual setting. Um, we have background noise coming in. Oh, great, fix that. Um, yeah, so so gonna gonna talk a little bit about my experiences in virtual settings. And as I was putting together this presentation, I was like, yeah, I do do a lot of virtual stuff, <laughs> even in a non-pandemic um, setting. Some of them are pre-pandemic. Some of them are, you know, the result of the pandemic. And then how that translates into the thinking of like recycling some of those experiences into this course that I'm planning that isn't run yet, but we're gonna run uh, next academic year and beyond. So. Uh, virtual experiences, starting with the personal. So uh, the picture there is a, is a video of my family putting together a birthday, happy birthday video um, for my younger brother who's in the US. Um, a lot of my family is geographically distributed. I'm originally from Ghana. My parents are still there. One brother is still there. Some brothers are in the US, some are in Canada. Um, and so, you know, even pre-pandemic, a lot of our family experiences are virtual. Um, and when we were in the US, we were also pretty far away from each other, so we don't see each other often. Um, for a lot of my adult life, my conversations with parents have been video calls <laughs> um, and family chats. I, I joke that my family has the long, one of the longest running Google Hangouts chats that's been going on since, I don't know, 2004 or something. <laughs> um, and um, but yeah, I mean, we we operate in a virtual space. That's just how we connect with each other and actually get things done. Um, 
now that I think about it, my wedding was also planned virtually um, <laughs> because we were geographically distributed <laughs> um, and everybody came out of town for that. But but I had a lot of personal experiences pre-pandemic operating virtually and doing things online over phone with Google Docs and spreadsheets uh, just because we couldn't be in the same place to, to make that um, happen. Um, most importantly, quite a number of my professional experiences pre-pandemic have also been virtual. Um, I do a lot of collaborative work. Um, and especially since grad school, I just realized that a lot of my collaborators I don't work with in person. Uh, I, when I was in grad school at UVA, I worked with the FDA. I did a little bit of a residency, but for most of the fellowship, it was just virtual conversation um, and uh, emails and, and back and forth. I actually have collaborators I have never met in person. <laughs> and one of them worked with me this year with a thesis student um, in NSCI and she's completed her thesis and the work got done. And I still have never met this collaborator in person, even though we, we chat and, and work quite a bit and are able to get things done. Um, so quite, Quite a bit of my engineering project work is with with people that I, I do things virtually. Even when we meet in person, it's often at a conference or some, um, you know, odd occasion. But the work itself gets done um, virtually, and we're able to do that uh, using the, the the tools that allow us to collaborate. So so it's a mode of operation that happens, you know, in a non-pandemic setting. Um, I also realized that some of my teaching has incorporated virtual experiences and I, I some of these I would call sort of micro virtual and some of us might be doing this and not recognizing that they are still virtual and online. So um, I used to do quite a bit of guest lectures in the courses that I did at Bucknell University where I was and it's not always that you can get a guest to travel but you can get them to show up online which a good number of my guests in the classroom did so they call into class and you know, I'd set up the video conferencing equipment and we they give their presentation. We'd have a Q&A and it all went down um, fairly well. Uh, pre pandemic, I had a student who had to finish up a, an independent study in order to graduate and didn't need to be on campus for the term. And so they basically did that online virtually <laughs> for that one term pre pandemic um, and finished up the work and they they came in to do their vinyl presentation in person. But most again of the work was done virtually and, and online with the online and virtual meetings. Um, the picture that I show there um, is from a class that we actually took to Ghana. So the course itself run in person, but the funny story about planning the course was that the course was all planned virtually because not only did we plan it from North America, I was on sabbatical at the time hanging out in Canada. So my my co-instructors and I met virtually because <laughs> that's all we could do because I was in Canada and they're in the US and put together this course with our point of contact in Ghana on the ground um, over the span of, I would say, six to nine months and then you know, showed up in May. I showed up in May like a week before we were supposed to travel. Um, a lot of the students only knew me virtually at that point because this was the first time they were signing up for this course. Um, and then we all just showed up, drove to the airport, went to Ghana and hoped everything worked out with all the virtual planning we had done. <laughs> um, and it did uh, for the most part. It did. So that that's a picture we took on, on one of the last days. Um, there so so that you know a whole course was planned remotely that was delivered at a different location and that also um, worked well there were times when i would travel for conferences and if i had time i would actually call into my class and do that virtually and and that would also work um sometimes and then i got to u of t and everything was online and we had to do this for large classes and um worked with really good colleagues who were you know i was co-teaching they were in charge of the course and able to pull off two semesters of a design course i think that worked out pretty successfully um but again i've mentored students from afar and um you know done some other work and even quite a bit of my learning has been online if i think about skills that i have now that i picked up it was mostly from looking at online references and <laughs> um, trying things on my own and and gathering knowledge from these virtual spaces in order to to make these things 
happen. And so um, virtual is a mode that has had a lot of value for me. But thinking about beyond me and um, for my students, which is what I'm getting to next, is um, a lot of professionals I, I know also work virtually in um, pre-pandemic. So my older brother is a software engineer, and he's been remote since 2012, <laughs> um, working from his basement. And his team has changed, his boss has changed, and he still does similar work. He's gone through reorgs and all of that, but that that is how he gets his work done. This is the way he works, and it, he's not unique in that sense at his company or in, in that space. Um, and so... I think this is a mode that students are going to encounter one way or another. And thinking about the statement I made earlier about what I care most is what students are able to do out there, not when they're with me in the classroom. The question is, what are some of the things that I can do now that prepares them to be um, able to make the most of those experiences as opposed to load them um, and gripe about them? So. What am I planning to do all this? I would like to incorporate virtual in an authentic way, um, building on some of the current pandemic experiences that I've had, um, which I'm thankful for, and previous virtual experiences that I've had the opportunity to reflect on, um, and hopefully help students and colleagues see the value of virtual in a non-pandemic setting. Um, I think it has value in providing flexibility in the ways that we um, access resources and access learning and talk to each other. Um, it does provide some enhanced modes of co collaboration, right? I always gripe that when I when I do things on paper, then I have to digitize it, and then it's not malleable in the digital space. Um, and often I'm doing a lot of iterative work with things that we need to we change. And so um, sometimes collaborating in digital space, uh, you know, even locally, even not virtually, can be um, useful. And it does create more possibility than solely in person. I would not be able to work with that nonprofit in Nigeria if we if we only insisted on in-person collaboration, right? Um, and we're able to do work across geographic lines because of the the ability to do this virtually. Um, and so there's there's a lot of possibilities of things that we have access to in terms of projects and opportunities that um, only insisting on in-person would would limit in a way. Um, before I go on, there's a couple of people to thank for the next set of slides that I'm about to go through. Um, on the left is the planning team that's helping me with the course uh, that um, I'm about to talk about. And on the right are my colleagues that were um, with me and had me in the design course that we run this first year that I learned quite a bit from and that inspired some of what we're, I'm going to talk about for for the ways we're going to reuse things in this this course. Um, and these are all people I have never met in person. Uh, so <laughs> um, talk about virtual and and being able to get stuff done. I guess I, I'm peeking at the chat quickly. I don't see any questions or clarifying points, but I can pause for a little bit if anyone has a burning question or something before I switch gears and talk quickly about where does this all go for next academic year and beyond. Going once. Going twice. All right, we will move on. So uh, I'm going to talk about a course called Praxis 3. It is a design course um, in the engineering science curriculum. And that's the course that I'm actually primarily responsible for. We shifted it from this year and didn't run in this year at all because one, we were redoing the course and B, um, we thought that next year might give us a better opportunity to have some of the in-person elements that are valuable, um, but that even if it wasn't in-person, it will give us some time to figure out um, all the moving parts to deliver it in a way that um, would be most valuable to the students. So I'll give you the whole picture. Um, what we're trying to do in this course is to actually incorporate virtual um, as a mode of operation in the design process. And we're doing this along two dimensions. Um, one dimension is we're trying to do a virtual global classroom. And so we want the students to collaborate with students at other universities as part of their team, uh, preferably non-engineering students. So they, they do this in a multidisciplinary fashion. Um, to have a global virtual team uh, working on a project and an opportunity that 
from the second dimension has a global context um, and so comes from afar, not locally. Um, and this is a valid mode of operation for engineers and thinking about giving students the broadest possible set of experiences. Not all of them will have to work this way. Some of them might. And so having seen and gone through this kind of experience, hopefully enables them to have the tools and the skills to deal with it later um, when they have to do it for real. Uh, and so that's one part of it. And they have to, um, you know, put together an engineered system that fits in this uh, global context that provides value for this community um, and the stakeholders and do that with people that they may not get a chance to see um, physically. Uh, this is, you know, bias, my bias is reminiscent of work that I do. <laughs> and so for me, it's a valid mode of operation. Um, uh, for students, and I think that um, they would get some value out of doing this. Uh, you know, when you when you think of actually large engineering firms, Boeing, um, or a couple of other manufacturers, this happens, right? Things get done in various places, geographically distributed, and then assembled and integrated um, elsewhere. And so uh, people have to figure out how to how to do this. Speaking of personal and family, my other brother who is in manufacturing who works for Toyota um, designs assembly lines that get, you know, parts of which get built and designed elsewhere and then shipped to their uh, location to assemble and, and manage and get supported from afar. And the design team um, often is different from the manufacturing team and they're geographically located um, elsewhere. In fact, his team that does the design of various plants um, in North America is also geographically distributed. <laughs> um, some of them are actually in Canada as well. And so um, even within the same firm, there's this kind of this, this organization that you may have to deal with um, in engineering. Just going to go through some of the course elements that we've thought about um, and how some of these things are going to play out uh, quickly, um, just so you can see what, what we're thinking. Um, we're borrowing some ideas from a previous design course and making having the course operate in two phases. I would say the first phase is about figuring out the context and figuring out the team, and it ends in a proposal um, for a design challenge that we as the course team has put out. Um, the reason why we're doing that is because often as part of an engineering proposal, you have to propose the team and why the team is the right team to do the work um, in addition to the ideas that you have. And so we think this fits nicely with the understanding the context, understanding your virtual team and the strengths that they bring, and it will allow that teaming piece to, to work well, right? And then they can talk about how the structure they have developed um, will fit in this, you know, virtual design that they're going to do. Um, then they go ahead and do a design and they do a pitch. Um, and again, if there, if this was a global challenge, which happens quite a bit, um, they might have to do this virtually, right? Um, and so this gives them what I think is a bit of an authentic experience for um, going through this process. Uh, in terms of global context, we are working with a number of different partners to curate a set of context that we know fit the constraints of the course because they have to build something that's actually valuable to the context and um, it would take them the whole course to figure out what that looks like. And so we want to scaffold that piece a bit. Um, but we um, are, are providing them access to these communities initially in the first couple of iterations through what we I would say proxies and, and serving as a sounding board. But over time, we want them to um, collaborate more with these communities uh, going forward. Virtual teams I've talked a little bit about. We have non-engineering students. Um, we are starting light with some consulting um, type relationships, which are also still very valuable in this kind of approach. And we actually have quite a bit of interest from external partners that we've been talking to, we're talking to another one on Monday, um, who want to do this uh, global virtual classroom and are excited to work with U of T and engineers. And um, some of them have experience doing this in other places at a smaller scale. Um, and so we're excited to see how this all plays out and expose our students to uh, what I think is a unique experience that I wish I had <laughs> when I was an undergrad. Um, and we're looking at some technology. Um, there is a challenge platform called Agorize that allows you to host a number of different challenges. And so we're, we're, we're hosting the projects as challenges that allows people to form teams on the platform and have mentors and interact with the, the 
the challenge, the people who are proposing the challenge in various ways. And so we're going to use that to organize that part of the course. We're not throwing out some of the other course tools that we have, like Quirkus, because students still need to do the, some of the typical course stuff. But that's where a lot of the project side of the course would happen. So there's some technology we're looking at there that that enables this to hopefully happen well. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is students still have to build something. Um, and you might be asking yourself, how do students build if they're virtual and, and geographically distributed? Um, we're looking at this from a, well, what do you need to do as an engineer perspective? Um, and breaking it down into, well, these are actions that you want to take. Um, and what are the tools and materials that allow you to take those actions? And how can you distribute those um, and collaborate on those virtually? Um, from my experience at Bucknell, we actually started running our courses in ways where students could do pretty much all their hands on in their dorm rooms if they wanted to. Uh, there are a number of technologies that package what would often be large bench top equipment um, into um, a small box like I've shown here that allow you to do you know some reasonable engineering and measurements that are portable and it can connect to a computer and allow you to to work in the space of your choosing this gives you the flexibility you're not tethered to a lab and when the labs are open and accessible um, and so there are pieces of this that you can do we're also toying around with having a manufacturing team um, that students can hand off designs to and um, have things manufactured for them which is often what would happen in a real engineering design setting. And so there are a couple of different models we can play around with um, there in terms of what can be done in person and locally and as a group in person and what can be done uh, online uh, distributed if need be. Uh, so having this kind of breakdown and thinking about the different actions and what tools allow us to, to do that, even on that building side um, is something that we're doing. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, worked very well in the past when we had students do things on their own um, outside the lab space. And so I think some of that can be reused. And there are other university partners that I've, uh, colleagues that I've talked to at other large institutions who have been able to do this successfully as well with students doing hands-on projects remotely. Um, so we're, we're pulling some learning from there. That's all I had in terms of, um, taking past experiences, recycling them into something that would hopefully be a, what I think is a cool future experience for students and for me and the teaching team. Um, I am happy to take any questions that people have at this point. Hope that was useful. Thank you for your time. I see there's a question from Eduardo. Uh, what platform did you use to teach? Um, so this past year, it was basically Quirkus and Zoom. Um, and that's that's kind of what we, yeah, that that's basically what what we did. Um, did we try anything else? Yeah, it was Quirkus, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams for the projects um, part of it. And so that worked out for the most part, what we were trying to do. We actually did run our, um, final showcase public showcase on zoom which actually worked out really well um so yeah those are the platforms i, I try to we try to keep the platform simple and familiar and work within what was available and zoom generally worked very well for what it is that we were trying to do so um that was the main interaction platform max go ahead yeah yeah sorry uh I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more in terms of the manufacturing teams, what you had in mind, I mean, given that directly related to your coming course. Uh, it would be staff getting involved, it would be a teaching team or students and so on. That's a conversation you and I need to have. <laughs> so, um, you know, the default is teaching team of some sort, like whoever is allowed in, in the space. Um, there, it, it really depends, right? So there are a number of different models. One is the teaching team. I wouldn't necessarily put that on staff. Um, and so it's sort of what we can get done with the teaching team or, you know, talking about the life fabrication facility, whatever staff already do, right? No more than what our staff already do and whatever else staff don't already do, we can handle as the teaching team um, if that's allowed. Um, there's also a model that we've played around with. If, if some students are local, they can take on the manufacturing role. And if they're allowed in the space, 
um, then they become the manufacturing team because they're local and they have access to the space. And so they develop the skills to make that happen. And so there's a different, the number of different scales that we can, mm. we can play around with, but, but that's the idea. Yeah. Uh, sorry. So follow up, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, do you see any change in the role of the staff? Perhaps because traditionally the staff hadn't been involved in this kind to this level with the with the teaching uh, of the courses, but with the new online platform, perhaps there is a need for a new level of staffing that is more more directly involved to support the online delivery, whether it's the manufacturing way of any different other ways. Yeah, no, I see that. Um, you know, like I said, I'm new to U of T, but um, at my previous institution, there was a lot of collaboration with staff in terms of course delivery um and we actually started a model where some of the technical staff would deliver some of the course content because um that made the most sense we also run a model where the staff train what we call student techs so they are technically staff in these spaces so there were there were more than just the professional staff there were students who were trained also you know at a at a good enough level who could then train other students but also perform the role of staff and so we leverage those students for student help beyond the teaching team or the TAs that we have. So there are a couple of models that could be explored that include providing students with interesting opportunities because when you're a tech staff, you learn a lot, right? <laughs> it's a oh, good yeah. way to apply your your engineering learning as well um, in, in the work that you do. You know, I always say that the best kind of campus job is a campus job that actually applies the skills that you're learning in your <laughs> in your degree and major, right? It gives you that particular experience um, to do that. I was fortunate to have that as an undergrad and that uh, worked out really well for me. And I think being able to create those kinds of opportunities for students is really um, cool and important um, if they if they want to do that. So, yeah. That's great, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Max.